what has your journey in tech been like so i joined netflix when they had like um, i think 4 to 5 million users also yeah yeah and uh, they just started the streaming product so the main product was still dvds by mail and uh, streaming was being piloted and it was doing well it was very very early stage so the beauty of it was it was very simple it just came it came down to three words like freedom with responsibility one very unique thing about fantasy sports is the entire thing is about those 25 minutes after a toss happens so typically there's a 7:30 7 o'clock game the toss will happen at 6:35 or you know 25 minutes before the game and from the toss till the time the game starts we didn't know how to do performance testing we did not know how to generate the load required yeah right to test an end to end system but then we got better over time we had no tools we were monolith like every other company and 6 week before you telling me that a tps of 400 team edits per second can go to what 30000 <laughs> right <laughs> and your contest join rate will spike and then how do you even do this right so i went back to my team even my team didn't believe me when i told them first but uh, but those were the days you know you had a lean team who were hungry we were learning on the job and we were like let's do it up until like a year or year and a half back we were native okay. also but then we completely moved to react native okay and one of the most love feature for me in react native is code push we did a lot of experimentation and we said that a 200 to 300 milliseconds difference in a page load time has a direct impact on the business metrics right we are able to like actually art- prove that through experimentation Hi, welcome to yet another episode of Scalar Pod. Uh, been a bit of a short break, uh, but uh, we have today with us uh, Amit from Dream Eleven. Thank you for taking out your time. Happy to be here. Yeah. So uh, one of the most used apps in India, I think, today right now. So I have a lot of uh, questions to ask about that. Um, but I think before that, I will start with uh, my favorite question that I ask all of my guests to start uh, of the you know podcast with, which is. uh what does the day at work uh look like for the city of dream 11 so it depends actually you know um, so there are uh, three different parts that that i kind of focus on right so yeah. sometimes it could be uh, we are in that planning phase of the quarter so it everything is about what's next to build what's the you know what are the features that we want to target what kind of bandwidth you need to allocate so a lot of meetings will go so i'll go to the office and there'll be a lot of meetings planned back to back thinking about how do we prioritize everything and how do we get the capacity to build and how do we get into execution right and once that phase is over sometimes it, there's a phase it's just it happens in phases sometimes it's a phase of people so what ends up happening is that uh, i'll have a lot of one on ones group one on ones and uh, team meetings uh, so sometimes i get into that and sometimes it could just be like strategic things at the org level right yeah. that some of the things at the management level and the cxo level that we need to do so it just varies yeah. and uh, the funny thing is sometimes you get to office and i step in at like say 9:30 10 and i'll be i won't even go to my desk yeah. and then i'm leaving at like 7 8 in the evening and i have not even gone to my desk i've been in <laughs> meeting rooms and uh, other days i end up sitting with like a 3 4 hour empty block and i'm like shocked myself what just happened you know i have so much time i love it i mean i get to a lot of uh, uh time to myself to think and do other things but yeah it varies is there uh, something uh, you do in particular to uh, increase these empty slots that you have because i think a empty slot of 4 5 hours at a stretch helps you also think constantly actually not just me i mean if i am struggling with it all i mean one of the most common complaints of people i think in all tech companies is like oh, we don't get time to do ic work yeah, right? yeah, and yeah. we've at the org level we've tried so many different models and even now we are like piloting something so from time to time we do that we we i block calendars actually i think i found that that is the only thing that works yeah. sometimes even that doesn't work because people just override <laughs> <laughs> and do invites right. but yeah i try to block chunks and things and then i also um i know days which are slower like so fridays most pe- a lot of people like to work from home mm-hmm. i like to go to office on fridays because it's quieter and then i get some time to myself so you have to just plan your things in that way nice 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 so so before uh, you know uh, getting into uh, knowing more about you know uh, dream 11 and how you are managing all of these things at the scale which i am very sure the viewers would be most interested in knowing uh, would love to uh, touch upon a little about your journey so far before dream 11 uh, you know what has your journey in tech been like sure so i had a very unexp- i mean i i did my graduation in computer science from mumbai university itself and then i took up a role uh, interestingly as an sap consultant i was doing abap programming it was one of the cool things out there at that point of time but i just did it for a year and i was like this was not for me right so then i moved to uh, 
uh, Massachusetts. So I did my master's there. I spent two years there. I did master's in computer science. And uh, while I was uh, there, I actually got an internship in Yahoo. And okay. So I spent uh, three months in California doing the internship and that got converted. So then that I was, moved. was a very cool company to go and oh, work very for. Very cool at company. That time, and, right? uh, you know, at that point... Uh, there was a war, right? Google, Yahoo, and it was in the space. And there was a very, very good talent at Yahoo back in the day. Even in terms of culture, it was like great. Yeah. So yeah, so my internship got converted into full time. So once I graduated, then I spent the next 10 plus years in the Valley. Uh, I spent around four plus years working for Yahoo. Yeah. And um, that's when the entire Hadoop ecosystem and all of those distributed, no SQL systems, distributed systems, all of that map reduce started happening. So it was a very good time to be there. And um, Unfortunately, the company, of course, you know, <laughs> didn't, didn't do that well. It was going downhill. And uh, that was in the where there's a lot of brain drain. Very good people from Yahoo went to companies like uh, LinkedIn, uh, Zynga at that point of yeah, time, yeah. and um, uh, Netflix, and all of all over the place, right? So, uh, Facebook. Um, so, that's when I moved to Netflix. So, again, I spent... So, I joined Netflix when they had like, um, I think, four to five million users also. Yeah. yeah. That, and... Um, they just started the streaming product. So the main product was still DVDs by mail. Yeah. And uh, streaming was being piloted and it was doing well. It was very, very early stage. The stop was DVDs very recently, I think. Yeah, yeah. It was a big event that it finally DVDs. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So the, it, was, it was a very good experience because uh, from there, then we saw how much people loved streaming and then we, how the company pivoted to completely focus on that and um, spent the next five years there. Uh, learned a lot. Um, AWS was a Netflix was the poster child for yeah, AWS yeah. back in the day. So learned a lot. Uh, monolith to microservices journey, how to scale scalable systems, chaos testing, yeah. resiliency. Uh, I worked in the data platform team there, so very close to like data engineering again with like hmm. uh, distributed systems. Yeah, when I left, we had gone from like three four million to hundred and ten million users yeah. at Netflix. It was a great journey and. Uh, so back in 2016, then I think me and my family, we decided to move back just for personal reasons. I always wanted to come back and see how it'll feel, life would be, right? I, right. I didn't want to have that regret that I right. didn't try. Yeah, so yeah. I was like, okay, let's, our kids were very, very young then. Mm. So I was like, let's, let's give it a shot. So we moved back in 2016, I joined Dream 11. And yeah, for the last seven years, I've been there now. Right. And, and uh, when you came back, like why, why Dream 11 at that time? Uh, no specific reason actually so my my um, one of the things in my head was that if i move back to india i will live in mumbai so I, my family is from mumbai we've spent majority of my life here yeah so i didn't want to move to bangalore or gurgaon or you know any such i was like so the options were very restricted right so um, somehow i got in touch with harsh and then we had a couple of conversations and um, so the interesting thing was he, uh, uh, Hush was very inspired by Netflix culture, mm -hmm. right? So when we had this conversation, and I, and I was very concerned about working in India. Back in the day, there was this thing of like, oh my God, culture in India, I don't mm -hmm. know how it will be, right? There's a lot of fear there. I think now though, I think a lot of startups are doing very well in terms of culture. We've come a long way, which is great. So, but that was a genuine concern because a lot of people said having worked in the Valley for such a long time, yeah. it becomes difficult to settle back in. Mm -hmm. uh, you're already settling with the rest of the ecosystem, but also work culture. Yeah. yeah. So when I spoke to Harsh and then he was like, uh, he actually told me this, you know, I'm hiring you 50% uh, for your tech skills, but 50% is because I want to build a company which is like, you know, inspired by the culture and build a similar kind of culture. Right. You, know, you cannot copy paste, it doesn't work. Yeah, of you course. have to adapt. Of course. But at least the basic principles, he was very interested in building a company on those lines. So... And that's, I think the conversation struck well, yeah, I think, and I, I am a sports fan. I'm a Manchester United fan. Uh, yeah. Not a good time to be a Manchester United <laughs> fan right now, but yeah, since years. So I always wondered that what it would be like um, marrying your hobby or your passion to your uh, profession, right. right? So Dream 11 is like a place for all sports fans. Yeah. It's the perfect uh, combination. So yeah, that's how Dream 11 happened. Nice, nice. Uh, I think uh, one, one question about because you talked about the culture uh, at Netflix. So like what's, what's uh, your take on what was key to that culture? Because it's Netflix's culture is also very famous. And I think very recently they 
made some uh, changes to the team but earlier they were also very known for just having that one layer of senior engineers only and it's very famous uh, but uh, i mean what's uh, the the magic do you think because they have literally invented some of the key pieces to distributed computing uh, how it works today service discovery and all of these things literally like yes. made by netflix and the engineering blog is obviously like is the bible for a lot of people uh, right so so you know how does that uh, like what's was the cookbook for this <laughs> so so the beauty of it was it was very simple right if it it just came it came down to three words like freedom with responsibility okay i think just they just that was the thing that every single thing that they decided beyond that you know you would you would have you would hear other things like context not control right mm. the idea is they like give people the context about what is to be done and let them figure it out right um, hire the smartest people um, give them a compensation that just blows their mind in a way right and they're not thinking about that right. so they're not trying to like you know get uh, <coughs> squeeze out the best offers offers don't matter you know if you get a netflix offer you would you wouldn't say no for the money for example you know right. and they were like and they wouldn't hire any juniors that day no freshers no they only hired senior talent they had one layer as you said everyone was a senior software engineer whether you're like 5 years or whether you're like 15 years and they organized people in various teams gave them responsibility and just told them to yeah just do the right thing mm-hmm. be curious right uh, <coughs> challenge the status quo um try to innovate as much as possible think out of the box it was just very simple freedom with responsibility you know what you but at the same time you have to deliver right, right? there were like there were a lot of um, back in the day fear of people going to netflix because they had a supposedly a firing culture also yeah. right so because if at any point of time they felt that uh, you weren't a high performer right or you're not right for the job right. they would have a very good conversation it was not Uh, anything bad then there right? yeah. they like you're not a right fit here right now and we are sure that you will be a very good fit somewhere else right now so it was an amicable decision and so a lot of people obviously we used to churn out as well yeah um so it was actually just simple <laughs> <laughs> uh and and i mean uh, netflix being able to uh, like hire a high density of like this senior engineering uh, senior engineer talent uh, back even in, in you know 2010 uh right uh, how how difficult or how easy is that to replicate something like that i mean obviously like you said can't be copy paste but uh, in india uh, like like to try and create like let's say a similar you know pool of talent where you know people who can be given context and then they will go and own the things on their own uh, you have obviously hired and built a pretty big tech team at dream 11 as well how easy or difficult is it just to do that here so first and foremost uh, i'll tell you something interesting it was not easy for netflix to start hiring when they started right right so in my early days at netflix i was amongst the first 200 people at netflix probably in the engineering team so when we used to go to conference like hadoop conference or something with our booth people used to walk up to us and ask us why is netflix here because it was supposed to be a media company mm. right not a technology company so you know so the battle started there right but all the work that netflix did with aws and the open sourcing and the blogging and you know when all of that started that's when the brand got built that's when people understood that oh this is what netflix does so there was a lot of work there and once that happened yes it was actually it made it a lot easy to hire um you know as i said it's not the same in india it it cannot be a copy paste right um <clears throat> but at the same time at at least at dream 11 i can speak about that right we I one of the challenges that I faced when I took over as CTO in 2016 was there were very few people with distributed systems experience in mm. India because scale was not that big at that point of time in any of the products right so um and one very uh, important thing I want to call out is like the entire Dream 11 team the Dream 11 engineering team is located in one single office in Mumbai Hmm. so we built a team of 500 engineers all sitting in one single office we don't have an any engineer outside other than a group companies we don't have anyone else so of course location became a very big handicap uh, oh. for me so we uh, reached out and i think unlike netflix where we were able to hire a lot of talent that knew what they were doing here it was all about hiring the people with the right attitude the right fundamentals and getting them into the system and training them right you know so and that has been true at various levels so we've hired very senior people also who are very good but don't have distributed systems or systems experience yeah. 
and also invested in freshers right at a certain point i was like okay this space of hiring is very slow and if i want to get some good talent you know through the pipeline we have to invest in this strategy right. so training them it has been just that and people who get trained and train other people and um, the only way to learn is learn on the job we say that right you watch videos or do whatever you read books doesn't matter but people who've gone through uh so we make a we there we have an internal joke right that every single ipl you move ahead by a few months it's not just two months right there's so much happening in an ipl there's in building it and going through it your skill level rises so fast and people right mature in their careers a lot more and they learn a lot and they and then they in turn teach new people so that's the mantra here has been different it's been like getting the right people and training them and getting them uh, right got it got it uh you talked about ipls and uh, currently i'm also working at a ipl driven company in that sense at jio cinema so uh, would love to talk some numbers uh, is like you know uh, what what does ipl really mean for you at dream 11 for example sure <coughs> so earlier it was only ipl now when i mean you know for all the games and all of these things etc so you know there's a so dream 11 is the uh, largest uh, fantasy sports platform in the world so we have 200 million registered users but um unlike a lot of other products the one very unique thing about uh, fantasy sports is the entire thing uh, is about those 25 minutes after a toss happens so typically there's a 7:30 7 o'clock game the toss will happen at 6:35 or you know 25 minutes before the game and from the toss till the time the game starts those 25 minutes when you're team building that's it that's what matters the most yeah so imagine all the people that show like 10 15 million people or maybe more that show interest in a game and want to play a huge percentage of them would come to your platform in that 25 minute compressed window right they want to come in and edit their teams because toss has been announced so they want to and the pitch conditions have come pitch report has been yeah has been announced and players have been announced so they come in and they change their teams at the same time a lot of people are not even comfortable joining contests uh before and so they wait you know huge more than 50% or more of our contests are also joined in those 25 minutes right and while doing that so what ends up happening is uh, you need to deposit money into your account balance and then when you joining contest there's an entry fee that you pay to join that contest so we are an uh platform which doesn't even doesn't only support very very high concurrency but it's not a read it's not just read only traffic there's yeah. a very very heavy amount of transactions happening on the system as yeah, well yeah because payments also need to payments flow through the system payments also need to flow contest joins need to happen so there's a contest and there's a size and then we can overfill so it's a very you know yeah. uh, keep the count of number of people that can can't overfill a contest for yeah, example yeah. new contests are being generated older contests are going away team edits are happening so lot of writes into the system as well right so then imagine so the biggest tournament of the year is IPL so obviously the the peaks so and uh, for us once an IPL final ends then there is like it's a peak of a traffic and for the next uh, maybe 8 9 months it stays there maybe rises slightly but uh, from an IPL to IPL the growth is always 3x to 4x mm. and you know said so that was the challenge in the early days right when i joined in 2016 17 and i had what seven back end engineers when i joined <laughs> <laughs> and um, i joined in december and the ipl was in four months yeah, yeah and we were like how do we even get started where where do we get started yeah, right yeah. what do we do and um, interestingly what we said was okay first you know the first uh, you know in a sense when we are at that stage uh, where we don't have a team and we need scale i think you always try to find that silver bullet yeah. that can solve my scale needs of today and then i'll build it for the future but right now what do i do so we used uh, amazon aurora back in the day right? it was very very yeah. niche they had that the writer and the reader with low very low latency that gave me a lot of horizontal scalability so we introduced that but the first system that we moved to uh, uh no sql databases was the leaderboard right, right. that the leaderboard because uh, back in the day all the contests were in mysql and leaderboard was a query when okay. i joined yeah yeah of course and we've said that okay you know this query might slow down with the increase scale and or may not work so let's start working on a leaderboard solution which is so we introduced spark cassandra based solution we blogged about it as well and we said we'll work on it and over the ipl we'll transition it slowly we'll run both in parallel and we do things and um, guess what day one of ipl first game the leaderboard query which is supposed to basically which is supposed to run in like a few seconds 
was taking seven to eight minutes to run. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually had to, you know, without even thinking, we had no choice but to just put that system into the line of fire. The leaderboard we migrated to the system overnight in that first single game, and it wasn't tested enough, and we weren't there. We had like finished coding it like. Maybe yeah. two weeks or one week before, but we had no we option. Had, we had no option. System was not yeah, yeah. <laughs> we had no option. So we said, okay, just let's do it. And thankfully, it actually worked out, and we actually the entire IPL was supported by that system. Right, right. You know, so yeah, those were the early days where it all started. But um, that's where because from last IPL to that IPL, and that time there were not so many other tournaments on the platform also. So we didn't get a lot of high scale testing. So it was a huge jump. So even today, day one of the IPL. So for example, um, last IPL, uh, the IPL before last, we hit like a max of seven million concurrent users on our platform. Hmm. And day one of the next IPL, we moved to ten point five. Hmm. Right? right. And just because the popularity of the World Cup and thanks to Geo Cinema, all the <laughs> <laughs> users, we actually hit eleven million, eleven point, just over eleven million concurrent users in this World Cup right. as well. So huge concurrency in the system, yeah. people coming in, and yeah, and this IPL again we're preparing. I think we're like what eight, eleven weeks away, and in that cycle again to get ready. I, I'm also in a lot of IPL resiliency meetings these days at work <laughs> myself as well. Uh, so uh, I mean, you know, when, when your engineers are getting hired, let's say all through the year, and, and like people are not necessarily joining in the middle of IPL, right? I mean, they're joining. Um, and, and and this is something I'm, I'm probably talking about in terms of my own learning as well. And I'm, I'm also building a team which is working on these systems. How do you probably coach your engineers or, or get them to understand uh, what does what does really that scale mean when like in a 25 minute window, 11 million people come in, try to make payments, try to build their teams. This is a lot of different activities they're doing. Like number of requests probably literally goes into hundreds of millions, billions even, right? So, so uh, not everybody like it's, it's not possible to just hire people who understand what that really means in terms of your entire system, right? Absolutely. So I think um, this also has changed over the years, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, the first couple of years, obviously, we ourselves were struggling. We didn't have the solutions, right? But right. With the, we didn't know how to do performance testing. We did not know how to generate the load required, yeah. right, to test an end-to-end -end system. But then we got better over time. We had no tools. We didn't have the, uh, we were monolith, like every other company. And then we weren't, like, but now, over a bit, but now if you ask me, because we have a, such a mature system that right. we built over the last six, seven years that we have so many microservices, we have so much tooling, telemetry, every single person has their own domain. And uh, we've also uh, sp spent a lot of time in um, building the platform, hmm. right? Because um, I know that the mantra at Dream11 is always going to be performance testing. So if I have to have every single service owner figure out performance testing from scratch, there's a lot of wastage for me and it's going to be very difficult. Right. So we invested heavily in the platform of like, you know, okay, you know, this is the platform. This is what you do. This is how you generate data. This is how you actually spin up your environment. These are how you actually run your tests. These are the how you hit the concurrency of your APIs and these other reports. So we actually try to abstract out a lot of the information. So that helps a lot. So, you know, so the developer is not starting from zero, yeah. right? Back in the day, that was the case. <laughs> because there were 12 developers. Now, but now when someone joins in, it's still complex because even today when you have to design a system from scratch, um, I think it, at some point it becomes uh, institutionalized learning because mm. the people who've been there, you know, the thing that has helped me the most um, is maybe because, because of the company, maybe it's also Mumbai hiring has been tough, of course, over the years, uh, but uh, our attrition is also very low. Up until the pandemic, you'll be surprised that attrition was in low single digit every year, nice. right? which actually helps a lot. So my my philosophy is like I would rather yeah people with context going away absolutely. hurts you a lot. It hurts right? it hurts a lot, right? So I would uh, <laughs> keep you know one person rather than hire two, yeah, right? Yeah. In a case because there's so much. Uh, so what happens is when the core team remains, and a lot of my leadership team also even now have been with me for four years, five years, six years, right? Yeah. When they're there. They it ends up passing on from like almost like a generation thing, right? They mm. they keep uh, teaching. So the new systems are built. Existing systems are exist uh, are there to learn from. Okay, this is the caching data that we put in. These are the data store choices. Why were these choices actually be right. made? Right? What are the data models that we choose? For example, and then some standard things that we do like memoization, caching layers, etc. So prevalent everywhere right. that it just 
this information just keeps uh, proliferating through the ranks as new in people join right and uh, and they just learn on the job and that helps a lot right right um, uh, another thing i you know want to also uh, talk about is um, like how typically do your systems scale up uh, when like let's say that that 25 minute period uh because anybody who has worked with you know sports kind of events knows this like i mean say there are 1 million users right now and suddenly it goes to you know 20 million over uh, a, you know a period of let's say 2 minutes or 1 minute kind of a thing uh and then there's like lots of you know articles and blogs and a lot of systems even managed systems available where you know do, there's automatic scaling up you know elastic systems and all of that um but none of that typically works if your audience pours in within 30 seconds or something right amazon i think there's if there's one feature from amazon that has never worked for us is been auto scaling yeah auto scaling <laughs> i mean anybody who's actually worked at scale and especially with spiky scale will tell you that you know, it, it does not just work it like that it doesn't work so so how do you typically predict the scale that you would require and, and so again um again a few years ago we we anticipated this right this is always going to happen we will keep adding matches you know currently in a year we are supporting around more than 17000 matches on the platform mm. and there are like and we divide the matches into like 60 years almost in mm. terms of user base right so uh, so we've spent a lot of time in maturing an end to end pipeline so it starts with the prediction so we have an ml algorithm that actually predicts every single you know minute or 10 minutes or whatever i don't know like as to like what is the traffic expected onto the system and then we've pre computed all the services what thresholds how much it does needs to scale for a typical you know what kind of this this user concurrency at this particular time whether it's before a match before before because the traffic patterns before and matches are, and after a match starts is very different yeah yeah before a match it's all about oh, where is the match what are all the contests that are there i need to join um payments as i said payment system team edits but as soon as match deadline hits all those systems the traffic falls and the leaderboard gets the pull yeah, the, yeah, yeah all the traffic right because very different systems the, get the exactly traffic. for the rest of the match it's completely different so at not only for a particular match but the stage of the match you know what is the based on the current user predict concurrency prediction what kind of traffic to expect based on that traffic what is the uh, infrastructure provisioning that i need to do and then we have a coincidentally we have a system in code name internally called scaler <laughs> 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 that actually is responsible to constantly keep scaling our systems up and down right, right. based on so it's we've it sort of made it was a very ad hoc back in the day and we used to scale up like few hours before matches just to be say because we take hours to scale up everything yeah yeah but we've gotten more efficient at it i think now for an ipl game i think we even for an ipl game or big matches we start scaling around maybe like 90 minutes or so before game yeah and uh, the goal i've given my team is that i want to be able to scale up a system in 6 minutes so that's the target that they're, they're yeah. working on um but yeah so it's an end to end pipeline with a lot of math and a lot of uh, load testing done behind the scenes to identify us. it's also distributed in nature right because the service owners do their tests and decide okay this is the pattern this is the infrastructure needed for this but they all put it in the system and the system just takes care of it right right uh, and and when we talk about the ability to scale up the second thing also that comes into picture is like uh, how do you anticipate failures and degrade also and i want to know about that because uh, what what i have seen is is wherever i have uh, worked on platforms which see this kind of scale i've seen that when things break uh then it always cascades into a lot of things because the user behavior is like okay it does not work so i'll retry yeah. or i will uninstall app install again retry otp so so i mean if you don't let users go where they want to they will try to go 50 other places as well so when things break how do you like sort of have management for that you know one very important thing is that uh, <clears throat> i'm reiterating this right so um, here users are actually creating a team and putting in money to join yeah. their contest they do not tolerate that i'm not able to edit my exactly, team it's yeah, like you know, you know money is yeah stuck somewhere you're not able absolutely. to do something you know you're, you're buying an e-commerce product if your payment is not going through you'll try again you'll not like it you'll get annoyed but you're like theek hai but here it's like you know the considering the prize money and all people are very very like 10x more passionate so any kind of outage is like almost criminal for us <laughs> <laughs> so um and you know the previous question that you were asking then when new engineers join and they're like you know how do they learn i think one thing that is to build a system but how to react 
in yeah, that exactly. window at that point of time when things fail and what to do that you only get when you are in that bore room mm. right going through that you have to go through that and look at other people actually who have encountered this before solving it and that's the only way to actually learn but in terms of outages again so we uh, we have very good telemetry systems now mm. in place and um, you know when it comes to failures 80 to 90% of the failure patterns repeat Hmm. It's very rare that you will suddenly, you know, once in a while, maybe ten percent things that happen would be like new to you, but and uh, but during that twenty five minutes, there are there are very few things that we can do because the window is so compressed. Yeah, exactly. So by the time we identify where, you know, and so we we said, okay, we do a un, we have to actually over engineer to be very honest, right? Hmm. Because the um, tolerance to failure is so low we have active passive systems we yeah, have the ability to, have to fall switch back rather than react actually right and obviously the first thing that we did was the app needs to be intelligent right it should know that okay which parts of the back end are failing and needs to it cannot crash hmm. right so like we have a graphql layer that sits in front of our entire microservices and uh, we call it intelligent client you okay. know we want our client to be very intelligent as to when to retry when not to retry what is the information that it is getting and based on that what it can render when can it use a local cache so we've done a lot of work there also right. but <clears throat> when it comes to team edits and all when you're trying to write obviously it doesn't help so there also we prioritize what works what doesn't work right so what's our utmost priority if like if everything is under strain what is the one thing that i always want thing to work is edit your teams Hmm. because if you've already joined a contest and you've put in like 40 rupees 50 rupees and you know you know your captain is not playing and if i don't let you edit your team before match deadline that's the thing that hurts you most yes, yes. right so that's top tier for us right? right the tier 2 becomes joining a contest because that's in revenue because every time a user is i mean in all of this user experience is paramount we are a user first uh, company but we also have to say okay what's what's okay for me right if things do actually go wrong what is the priority for me and then is next is contest joined you know that hits my revenue so i have to fix that and to do that obviously the payment systems come into the picture but a lot of the users already have account balances through which they join but a huge percentage of them go through the payment and see you know we for this ipl we are preparing for a payment tps of maybe uh, thousands basically right mm. and that's when there is a match deadline of ipl on dream 11 the entire payment infrastructure of india <laughs> gets affected so we work with pgs we work with pas we work with banks very very closely you know even with upi with npci sorry we work with them and we make sure that we are you know we are we are giving them an estimate of what kind of traffic to ex- uh, to ex- expect right, right. the tps so there's a lot of preparation that actually happens and uh, when an outage happens what are the things that we can do very few hmm. rolling restart of all the application servers to clear <laughs> the cache it's like that age old thing of like okay restart your computer <laughs> doesn't work we do that sometimes it's uh, we do realize that even though we've scaled sometimes it's a manual error or sometimes we realize that oh, the scale is more than anticipated so we scale yeah, up our scale systems up, yeah. that's one thing that we do uh with databases aurora and all of those there is failovers that we can do right, right? the master to reader yeah. failovers we try those and um we have active passive active active sometimes some shards don't work so we then we shift traffic so we do some some of those patterns so it's, it's you cannot do something radical you know yeah. because the window is so small you need to have a very Debug and exactly. come up with a new solution that's not possible in that time frame so every minute matters right so what we spend a lot of time in prepping is uh, our standard operating procedures hmm. and the first step is i need to identify within like a minute or two where is the problem because we are talking about 100 plus microservices mm. right and uh, with so much traffic i need we have a dash we have spent so much time building dashboards to identify exactly where the issue is right. that's step number 1 step number 2 is within that the service owner is on call he knows what's happening you know he should be able to identify what is going wrong right. going wrong at that particular time and for whatever he sees there is a step already defined a playbook for playbook for yeah, each and every that is the only book. thing that works because yeah. other than that by the time you figure out what has happened that's it matches mm. started and their users are not happy <laughs> right right so we're talking about this whole 25 minute thing uh i'd uh, love to also talk about like uh you know i think we were just discussing a while back about bringing the the time uh, of like finalizing your team yes. uh and i think fans are really happy that it's possible uh but what does it really take to be able to do that like obviously if you do a you know cut off of your team creation sometime before the match you got time to reconcile the data and everything um but if you have to like bring it 
like to the you know, T zero <laughs> was the challenge in doing that. Just to get so back before the two thousand eighteen IPL, just to give context to everyone who's listening, uh, before two thousand eighteen IPL, yeah. the match deadline used to be one hour before the actual match start time. Right. So what that meant is that you can come in and join a contest at any point of time because the last one hour you weren't anyways allowed to join that contest in the match, and uh, you had no team information, so you would create a team, join a contest, and move away. Yeah. What that meant is that the maxed TPS that we get in contest join was three hundred to four hundred. Hmm. joins per second and even team edits would be like similar in that range right and um, this is very interesting um, and this is back in 2018 early feb 2018 and again my team size then also the total deck team size was again i think 40 or 50 not more than that yeah and we were struggling to keep up and be ready for ipl in six weeks okay. and harsh was our ceo so harsh and i were having this conversation and he said uh, amit uh, i'm going to tell you something don't freak out <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "What? I was like six weeks to IPL. What is he talking about?" So he was like, uh, "What if we change the match timing to match deadline? Imagine if all users would be able to join the contest till the last minute." And and in my mind, I'm now like, they can factor in the team selection and yes, all of that. Yes, because right? that's what happens, right? Because now they have a lot more information about what's going to happen in the game. Yeah. What, as I said, what's the pitch report and who's playing, who's not playing, and they're actually also glued to the game. Yeah, they, they listen to the commentator saying commentary. that this player is not so in they have form. A lot more this player is in injury. So that you think of in their mind, oh, match is there, I should join. And I'm like, what are you saying? Because you know, it translates into complete different user behavior. Yeah, yeah. Everything has been distributed over the last few days since the match has been open. We call it. And suddenly, if you do this, and six week before you're telling me that a TPS of 400 uh, team edits per second can go to what? Thirty <laughs> thousand, right? <laughs> and your contest join rate will spike, and then how do you even do this, right? So I went back to my team. Even my team didn't believe me when I told them first. But uh, but those were the days, you know. You had a lean team. We were hungry. We were learning on the job, and we were like, let's do it. <laughs> you know, it's great for users. It changes your engagement to a whole different level, Completely, right? I mean, from business, right? it changes from everything. From user concurrency, the user concurrency was never an issue prior to that. I mean, it was, but not to this extent, right? Right. And uh, we were like, okay, let's uh, let's do it. So. we probably didn't come up with the most elegant solutions back in the back at that time but we were we said okay let's shard where we need so team service was simple because not simple per se now in hindsight everything seems simple <laughs> but uh, we said okay let's shard it into multiple shards and handle that traffic contest joins was a challenge you know um, today so the biggest challenge with contest join is there is one big contest we call it the mega contest huh. and uh, i think lately we supported what so 1.5 crore entries or 2 crore entries at one single contest and uh, when every uh, time users come onto the platform everyone wants to join that so what i need to do is there's a transaction that happens right so you join the contest and it to update the number of total slots. number of the empty slots now yeah. back in the day it was a mysql world so it worked fine but when we had to our requirements for contest joins per second currently for this ipl by the way are 30000 contest joins per second now you know the max number that i could get out of mysql with we worked with like aws aurora teams we worked with every single mysql expert that any we did everything we could and the max we could achieve was 2500 This is where cap theorem rubber meets the road. Yeah, right? rubber meets the road, right? You that, need consistency and you need availability. Absolutely. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying, right? In fantasy sports platform, uh, you need a distributed system, but sorry, you cannot be eventually consistent. Yeah. Right. And I'm like, how does that even work, right? And um, even with any uh, and what's a typical contest join flow? I come, I I click on a contest, and the first call goes to do I have a promotion for me? Yeah. I have to check that if that happens, then my this fails, and I have to make an entry there. Then I have to go to my um i have to go to the wallet to deduct the money yeah. then i have to go to join the contest then i have to update the counter and then i have to come back with all the entries that have yeah. happened this is the typical flow now how do i cut it how do i once i move to microservices my brief wallet is being deducted somewhere else my promotion is somewhere else and even contest my how do i get these two transactions happening at the same time so that i you know i never overfill a contest hmm. so my sequel didn't work we introduced something called as volt db i don't know if uh, it's not a very popular database in india but that's an in memory database that worked very well for us we still on it so we introduced volt db at that point of time and uh, lot of work so but that was very you know within 6 weeks we were able to pull out complete user behavior change and that's and that even in terms of business impact it has a huge business impact right so for early stage startups you cannot from as a tech team you cannot say no 
because you know you have an opportunity if you don't do it a competition is going to do it if you right. don't if you don't cash on that idea of that IPL back in the day at that point of time and you don't get that bump your future growth also gets affected correct, right correct correct so yeah it was uh, <laughs> pretty challenging but we actually ended up uh, doing a pretty good job i think right right so so i mean uh, i think with with now your level of concurrency the number of requests per second across many of your services like from wallet to like team joy and all of these will be like tremendously high right it's thousands per second thousands it's per yeah second. it's like thousands per second is it uh, um, the team service is being tested for i think 100 or 150000 team edits per second contest right. service is being tested for 30000 transactions per second right payments again like 6 7 8 100 thousand dps which is also payments is one of the most challenging <laughs> things to be very honest because of the external dependencies and what ends up happening is as you introduce so so you you know you build, build the base product what is a base product base product is you select a match you find the contest you want to join to join that you create a team and then once you're done you wait and the match starts and you start um, engaging with the leaderboard but you want to give constantly want to give users new features more value yeah. better experience so what do you do you add features but the problem is your your product is very high scale so every single feature that you introduce it has to land on that it has to land on that page and it has to also support that scale so the challenge keeps increasing so we launched a feature called guru teams last mm-hmm. ipl which is basically that um, you know some gurus on the platform very good would give their teams to you and then you take a template and then build on top of it basically okay right so a huge portion of a users love like the feature small cases for <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fantasy teams absolutely nice. <laughs> so um, now that feature this huge adoption so i have to make sure that that also scales mm-hmm. then in the leaderboard i have fantasy i have fantasy commentary of interviews i have introduced statistics which are keep updating as the match is going on and i have live scorecard also now yeah. within it and before i think so this we have a concept of uh, network of sorts you know you can connect with your friends etc so when they join a contest you can see that these friends your know, typical feature in all uh, thing where there's a network that your friends are doing this so within every match every contest have to show that list but what ends up happening is every time you keep building these things you keep adding more work to test scalable systems and then you have to be like okay this works but how does this work at scale hmm. so there's a lot of work that goes and then you have to test so the amount of things that you have to test for that new scale that's uh, expected right. also keeps rising right, right right so yeah so that's another challenge that we face yeah, about that i think uh, whatever you do you land it on the base layer which is at scale i think i can relate to that a lot because i think uh, uh, we had stuff like uh, you know while you're watching a match you can see some textual commentary live that's, that's coming in and uh that works fine because it can be highly cached it's a get request right i mean every ball one minute you just update a file on the catch on the cd and then you just fetch it and then somebody thought of adding reactions to it and, and, and obviously that can't be cached like it's real time reactions and then and then the team building reaction they came up with like the first iteration of what they built and and then when the seniors looked at it they're like bro <laughs> <laughs> you know, do you know there will be and, and 30 million people <laughs> reacting to it yeah and 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 a lot of times i think every single engineer who's worked on scale has gotten this reaction from a product manager saying like isme kya problem hai but it's so ye chhota sa to change hai isme right but the repercussions that can happen behind the scenes yeah. to actually introduce that like making a is, simple button and then making 20 million people yeah. click on that button very different things uh, yeah, that happens yeah absolutely uh so you are also talking about uh, another thing i would love to delve a little bit more deeper into talking about uh, th- your client being smart uh, mm. right uh, so so uh, you know you know typically with uh, clients i think one of the biggest challenges is like let's say something in the client breaks like something that needs you to update the client itself right um typically like if it's an app like an android or ios app it means like a release cycle and all of these things uh what does the thought go into like like making the client smart because like the the tolerance to breakage is sort of even less like sometimes like you can do a rolling restart on the back end yeah you can't do that like if something is broken on the client and it needs to be fixed that means you're sort of out of business for 7 sure. days maybe yeah so so uh, what is the thought that goes into the client because the, the size and scale that you are you can't afford client breakages at all it's just something that can't happen right so that's actually interesting segue right i think something i wanted to talk about so um up until like a year or year and a half back we were native right okay. so but then we've completely moved to react native okay and one of the the 
the most loved feature for me in react native is code push code push right yeah. where you don't need a release to actually do exactly these kind of things so was that the most important reason you shifted ah uh, not really i okay. think there were multiple i'll come to that in a sure. bit but uh, to be honest um, once the client is shipped it ship you can't do anything so i think mm. it's all about testing slowly rolling it out see one of the advantages of uh, having scaled a lot of challenges but one of the advantages of being a highly scalable product is once you release something um the moment like 1% or 2% of your user base adopts that client yeah, or yeah. lower you have you enough, can do all sorts yeah, of problems also your statistic yeah statistically you know exactly what your crash rate is going to be what mm. are the challenges right so yeah. you you get an it's not like a small set of users where it, everyone has gotten it and now what do you do yeah so that you bank on that and then moment we identify something is wrong we start, so what we do is we first we release everything to our own Uh, employee base employee base yeah, right yeah. so now that itself is like a thousand people yeah. so that catches a lot of problems that actually happens and then we release the app and we phase it out slowly and with features so everything see everything is about rolling it out slowly whether it's a feature from back end or whether it's an app release right. i think that is the only way and then the moment we hit even not even 1% like 100000 users if we hit and if things are working across we get a good uh, sampling of the devices the cities right. you know bandwidth everything and we and screen sizes etc so we are pretty confident and then we scale it up right so it's rare that we've gotten into a situation touch foot <laughs> <laughs> that our client has an issue but we do set hot fixes yeah. when that happens and uh, hopefully for subject we have to do sometimes um but i think um one of the challenges with app, apps for me at least i personally i face in india and I, everybody knows how difficult it is to find talent in india but for me the most important difficult thing to hire was uh, ios and app uh, ios and android developers that's true actually it, it was like very very difficult, very difficult. Find very at, good quality at one point and... my team was growing and then my android developer team size was shrinking so if i would hire like one dev in like 3 months and two would leave hmm. you know and then we have always flirted with the idea of going cross platform we looked at flutter we looked at rn and multiple times we gave up and then um, so we have another group company called as fan code it's okay. into like content and live live streaming of sports right. and videos and content and commerce etc so that we started around 5 years ago so that's when when we started that we said okay you know this is a perfect opportunity to pilot rn hmm. to see how it works out but Correct. because as an app built from scratch hmm. so they went out there and they scaled they also have a few million users now and they it's it's they did a pretty good job and that gave us a lot of confidence that it can be done right so 2021 we made a very elaborate plan but you know when uh in a tech team there are ratios there is a back end to front end to qa and all like how do i makes a huge migration project run in parallel without disrupting the ratios yeah, and the yeah. opportunity cost that's a huge yeah, yeah, yeah. problem so so i think the way we invested was okay you know we knew that we had to inflate the um front end team in yeah, parallel so what we did was we actually had, i had a fresher batch from uh, join that time a 60 uh, people batch and what i did was i took 12 of them <laughs> gave them three seniors and said parallel may start building the rn app right you know we said we'll build it in parallel and then keep working with the main team and we some of created an elaborate project of you know how it will happen obviously product was not happy initially because things were slowing down uh, but we said this is but the good thing was it was a commitment right from the top right harsh and everyone we were all committed that because we couldn't hire app developers yeah and the promise of having one single platform see back in the day Uh, and i'll come to it again but back in the day the promise was that you write one code and goes to board so your efficiency doubles you have code pushes yeah. available um hiring you just need javascript engineers once you get into react native you yeah. just have javascript engineers and uh, it becomes closer to your java you know so now my java and javascript it's like your back end engineers also a lot of them were from node js they also knew javascript so your team also becomes very homogenous right, right from that perspective so there are a lot of these advantages that were there and very very enticing but when you do your research for such things online what ends up happening is you'll get like 10 articles about how someone went to rn and was great and then 10 about how they went back <laughs> <Correct>. <laughs> and it didn't work right so i'm like you can't make a decision based on this huh. right you have to like try it yourself. yourself and do it yeah. and it was a huge investment and we 2021 we started and the target was by 2022 ipl will be on rn completely and in fair end we finished the app and we were like very excited and uh, we just had a few performance tweaks we called it at that point of time to do we said we'll finish it in 2 weeks and um, the startup time for my um, native app was 6 to 7 seconds that time 
and the rn app that we built the startup time was 18 seconds oh <laughs> and it was a disaster right every single place when we got into it looking at the performance tuning and stuff we had like you know not anticipated that it's going to be such a huge setback and um, you know that's when we actually had a town hall and we actually had to announce to the entire company that our entire rn project which we worked on for one year had like you know had huge, hit a huge setback or almost like a failure right and yeah. uh, again talks about should we abandon what do we do but you know that's not our culture we said you know what we'll back ourselves up so we pivoted we said okay you know what one team continues whatever things we weren't able to build in native and we will build in rn we'll port those features which are p0 for ipl will go but we won't give up hmm. and then after that we our biggest learning was we underestimated the amount of work that it needs to create a good rn app yeah so the first thing that we did was that you said we, we said that before building the app let's build the tooling hmm. you know i want systems same performance testing i want the ability to objectively say what is the delta between a screen that loads on native and a screen that loads on react native right so we spent the next 2 3 months first building tooling so that going forward we it's not a subjective call it's working here it's not working here it was everything was data driven right and see our core values are what we call it duput so it's data obsession it's ownership it's perseverance is user first and transparency nice so so we combine all it together it like let's be users you know cannot get bad experience so we have to make sure that you know up until performance is not at par we can't go live so how do we get that confidence it's subjective as well as data so let's build performance tooling so we get so we we spent a lot of time instrumenting the app building uh, suites of uh, tooling around in a way where we clearly have the numbers hey. we spent another year on the migration okay and even believe it we actually ended up building an rn app that has better performance than the native app mm. and uh, i was very circumspect i i said no that uh, i thought that you know i'll well, have double the front end developer suddenly because if i have one single platform everyone is doing rn but uh, you'll hear a lot that that's only in theory yeah in practice you know in practice you'll get like 20% efficiency 30% efficiency but for us actually no we actually ended up more than 90% of our code base is common now mm. and my entire team of like rn engineers have it's like almost having twice the number of people that we have yeah. and the features like code push and all of that and hiring it's like a solved problem so we went through that journey it was like um, typically cult- culture learning right we yeah. we tried we failed we accepted everyone from the top said yes we failed we'll try again and we but we persevered we kept trying and then yeah we are completely rn right now other than a small chat app because it still has some limitations as a platform but mm. 99% of the app is on rn now nice nice i think this this whole measure the performance while you're building it i think reminds me of this uh, book uh, creative selection by ken kosianda he was one of the early employees at apple and he had written about how steve jobs one day came and said that we need to have our own browser and they were like okay we'll port uh, the kde conqueror browser at that time khtml and make safari out of it and they made a poc and uh, it, it did not do anything except just render html and uh, that had uh, so so you know they said that our load time can't be more than any of the competition so that okay the load time just they made a board and they wrote it down that okay this is some milliseconds load time they said that okay now you have to add all the features that other browsers have but this number can't come down so even if you add a new feature probably parsing the url or something which which adds a few milliseconds to it because it's logic yeah. so then in that same pull request you will have to also clean up something so that no pr is merged unless this number either stays same or goes down otherwise you would merge and then they were acting work like that for one year and they <laughs> built a safari i think yeah i mean sometimes that's that's the constraint that you have and you can't yeah i mean th- it's all about throughput right i yeah. mean i have tested my service at scale it works well I, even if you give me 10 15 20 million users it'll work but then when i'm introducing a new feature in that service i have to make sure that the throughput doesn't go down yeah right i mean every single thing that's added as the base expectation a user is coming with and you can't absolutely. tinker with that right? absolutely right. Uh, and and what's been your you know uh, experience with with uh, react native after moving uh, from native are there any like typical limitations things that you are able to do with native better so i think the only thing as i said i think the the chat portion that we have today hmm. it's i think it react native has some issues when it comes to lists list formats and stuff right okay. so there's a couple of these things but other than that we've not hit any limitations or we've just figured our way out it took us time 
right but the but we've developed so much muscle around it now right. that i have around 80 to 100 engineers who know rn right dream 11 right and they're all experienced in building and we are churning out and we've built a lot of tooling also hmm. as i said in performance it's not that performance is not a one time thing yeah. it's very easy to make mistakes in rn and then okay introduce performance lags or delays yeah, yeah. uh the startup time that i was talking about it was 7 seconds for native in rn now my startup time i've gotten it down to 3.5 seconds Nice. This is on that median devices and all yeah. that we target. It, it varies a lot, right? Of course, of course. So for a lot of the pages, even when we actually, did, you know, one another key insight that we actually got through the RN project was that how much users care about performance. Yeah. So we've been able to actually experiment. We we were big believers in experimentation. We have a in-house experimentation system called as DRS. <laughs> Likely we call it decision review system. Okay. So we did a lot of experimentation and we said that a 200 to 300 milliseconds difference in a page load time has a direct impact on the business metrics yes. right we are able to like actually ad- prove that through experimentation and we've seen that so um uh, with rn that uh, we, we are not, we saw that when we actually were rolling out and scaling up things in some of the features that we migrated we actually got a bump in business hmm. and if you ask me today are there any major challenges in rn we are facing no Yeah. we are happy with performance we are happy with the speed of which we are executing so many things so last year there was this uh, tds change that happened for us which we need to make in the app and there was a deadline of a day so we did that entire feature and did a code push of the entire feature a day before ipl you know yeah. that is a confidence level of the team now that we are able to push so many things <laughs> <laughs> through code push which cuts down my yeah. cycle you know a lot so a lot of advantages and uh, it took us a while to get there but now i think it's working very well for us nice nice uh and then i mean uh this this performance drives uh, better business results is something i mean i have uh, seen a lot of studies on that and even people who don't believe it typically try it out and the results prove yeah. that it does true uh, there's that whole i think 2006 7 time amazon's famous study you know they they increased artificially the checkout time and they saw people drop off and they were like But who would think, right? Milliseconds, hundred yeah. milliseconds, hundred fifty milliseconds, because what that translates into the user side, it's so difficult to. But sometimes, I, I, even when I'm using apps, I think th- there's this just a slight bit of discomfort, like some grains in your food kind of thing, right? I mean, you don't really put a finger on it, but if an app is a bit janky, if if yeah. like you click the button and the animation starts hundred milliseconds later, it just gives you a bit of a you know icky feeling that you know, it's it's really not perfect, and then. If you have seen a world where it is perfect then it just shows up on your face a lot. Yeah, yeah. users more. hate downgrade of any kind because yeah. some, when we launched some of the RNA like this looks okay yeah but if you're used to something better then users will never accept a downgrade there like something yeah. is wrong for yeah, sure. Yeah yeah interesting. Uh another thing is like how, how uh, important it is uh, to to for your engineers and I'm doing a segue to a very different thing is uh, to to um understand the context of the sports uh because i feel like you know for example things you were saying that when does the leaderboard service get a lot of hits or when does the you know team creation service get a lot of hits i think that, that it depends a lot on the context of the sports being played a lot right so typically like some anybody building the product from obviously the product managers but also the engineers you know the operations people they have to uh you know very deeply understand the nature of how people react to sports right so yes and no right to be honest okay. i think um, um the way we look at systems huh. right i think you can build a new um, you you know the service boundary you know what your service is capable of and if you're good with distributed systems you will give me i'll tell you the throughput that i want right so when that throughput is going to come under what scenarios you as an engineer don't need to know that okay so that right yeah <laughs> but if you are a sports fan you know what we also believe is like you know that the entire bottom up culture ideas coming from everywhere yeah. feeling for the product you know as a sports fan if you understand sports you know how people are engaged with them you know that that cultural mindset of when someone is a sports fan and how they feel about it that actually then directly uh translates into how they actually look and build their systems also they are pas- more passionate about what they're trying to do right. and you know everything a lot you know that's the way but honestly we have people who are not into sports some of them it's not like it's only for sports fans, right it's strange most of the people are but sure, there are certain sure. people who are not right and, and and i'm perfectly fine because they are like okay i'm here to build systems and i know what scale you need i know what is the purpose of the system i know how to architect and build it and that also works got it got it it makes sense perfect sense uh, uh 
another thing is like uh, you know uh, in this uh, space of like you know building i would say i will put a painted with a broader brush saying that you know building great experiences for sports fans not just about fantasy sports uh, okay uh, what are the things that you see are uh, you know coming up i mean building fantasy teams obviously it's one of the biggest ways a sports fan expresses themselves but are there other things also you are thinking of so you know dream 11 started back in 2013 or whatever right and the idea was that how do you make um people who love sports how to make them engage better you know if you're if you love a game if you're playing on dream 11 it just increases the engagement with the sport right yes. that was the entire concept so when we saw that and we got uh, a good product built at scale we said well you know what there's a lot of opportunity for sports as a sector in this country right so so the the parent company dream sports of dream 11 right so the the motto is what make sports better right that's what we want to do now what does a sports fan want right a sports fan wants to watch his favorite sports from whatever like so tier 1 sports not an issue tier 1 cricket not an issue but when it comes to football when it comes to volleyball when it comes to handball so many other things tier 2 matches whether it's a tamil nadu premier league and all of that all that content you need access to you want to buy merch right sports yeah, merch yeah. it's not easy in india you know some today also sometimes you have to think where is the original what are you going to do sports merchandise then there is sports travel that you want to do i want to travel to different places and watch the games how do i right. get the tickets what's my hotel stay so and then you want to play out there how do i know where so what we started looking at from the ecosystem was you know what uh, and then sports games you know if i am a cricket lover i would love to play a game actual game not like fantasy sports but in <laughs> actual game on cricket right so we said you know what we'll do is we'll make sure that we'll try to give every single thing that touches the life of a sports fan under the dream sports umbrella so we started fan code with this vision of live streaming we actually had the india west indies series live streamed on fan code hey. um and a lot of other tier 2 tier 3 content that users are not able to find you know niche for them so we started that there's commerce on fan code as well then we have an in house studio called as dream game studios that just two months back launched a dream cricket as a pilot app right, right. for uh, trying to build the fifa into cricket for example we're trying oh, to build that nice. out so we're doing that Uh, it's like have, a mobile game. Yes, oh, it's a mobile brilliant. game called Dream Cricket, and then there is uh, Dream Set Go, which is a travel, uh, uh, sports travel, um, right? So you want to uh, have travel experience. You want to go to Manchester United and watch a game, or you want to go to Wimbledon or IPL. You go to Dream Set Go, they'll figure it out for you. So we started like figuring out all these various places, and we are also looking into maybe the future of VR as to how does sports fit into that? Is is there a play that we can make there? So constantly looking at. new opportunities anything and not only sports you know i think we've also realized that most a lot of sports fans are into fitness right. so there is a fitness related thing that we can actually get into so we're looking at the entire sector as a whole and trying to see that what is something that a sports fan need and then how can we use from a technology and part offline part technology yeah. uh, platform and they like fulfill all the uh, nice. needs of a user and 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 in doing all of these things uh, right i am uh, bound to ask this question because that's what everybody is talking about this is about ai and, and you know uh, even like the last few uh, conferences by even the big companies like google and microsoft have been about their ai products so obviously the, the ai question <laughs> is that uh, do you do you see like typically like you know these text generation image generation generative ai and transformer models which uh, you know these days a uh, lot of new uh, advancements and releases in that um, do you see using uh, any such tool in in building any of these experiences around sports uh, right now yeah we are exploring for sure i think um, i think uh, generative ai has been there for a while i think over the last one year it has just uh, come after chat gpt just come in mainstream public releases have been yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so i think what's uh, what what's very interesting there is how the open source models are catching up so fast with all yeah. the proprietary ones but that that being said um so we, as soon as all this happened we actually did a hackathon just like a lot of our companies with a hackathon and it was amazing to see in two days the kind of ideas within our product that people had come up with hey. i think one of them actually even piloted right so the small small increment within the product we are actually trying to do and uh, on the side scale we actually so recently what we've done is uh, one thing that we realized was that it's we have great talent in india we've built a good team we've trained them a lot of people have worked but just like how we had to f- hire people with distributed systems experience now there are some more, more options but there are still certain things that we don't get 
enough people or people with that experience it's not that people are not keen right so especially in the ml space for example we wanted to causal inferencing we wanted to get deep into reinforcement learning even gen ai so what we've actually done is we've uh, we're collaborating with columbia university in new york okay and we've just like last month opened an first office in new york nice. for dream 11 so we we're going to have a very small team there hmm. and we are going to get uh, deep into collaboration with columbia and its professors and work on a lot of projects so we hope that that investment in the areas that are like niche in the right. ai space you know when it comes to like you know how nvidia and all these uh, people are able to generate this uh, the new model the graphics that they're doing yeah. and you know the game development itself yeah. is going to get a lot easier for right. example then how can we capitalize on that in things like dream game studios for example so right. all this uh, upcoming technologies we want to invest heavily working with columbia and try to come up and figure out that how can we s- again same what is, at the core of it what we do is what is user problem to solve right we don't do anything if there's a user problem right we don't do anything just because we want to so identify opportunities in the sports ecosystem and see if there is a solution that seems to f- create something that fits it and then work on it that and integrate nice nice i can think of probably like like just just a personal uh, thing i could think of is like if i can give some of my inputs while creating a team like I, i'm thinking that it will be a very you know bowling friendly pitch and i think that paces will do well and autofill the team according to the hackathon that is one of the hackathon projects it's yeah. in the works that's what i'm nice, saying that nice, nice. we were like amazed at you know that an yeah. ai team planner of sorts yeah yeah so you have to, to create your own team but we can help you you know start off i think that's what jenny is doing the majority of the times it cannot finish everything for you But you give some inputs in there. Yeah, zero to eighty percent is happening yeah. like very fast, and that's where that's where we also believe that we can get into. Nice, nice. Uh, yeah. So when we're talking about these, uh, you know, uh, at scale, the number of transactions that happen, and then one thing is about the the systems where the transaction will happen, like the APIs where it will hit, and then scaling those things up. But all this generates. like lots of data as well right and and some of it is obviously required to to show immediate features to the user like you built a team and and the leaderboards for example so so that has to process a lot of data like of all the players and get the leaderboard and i'm sure there's also going to be a lot of data which probably is not required to show to the user immediately but it's required for business context and and all of these things so uh, and then with with someone like you who has a lot of background in data as well like what's the thought that goes into uh, designing the data pipelines also because i mean cost is also something you have to take care of I mean, you don't have infinite <laughs> storage or infinite bandwidth right so as so we we were on uh, ga for a very long time right. uh, not a very long time but like a few years and then when we started hitting that scale very soon we realized so as it was not even cost the cost was definitely prohibitive uh, but also i think i wanted to see a real time um, dashboards of stuff and there was a limitation then that beyond 300000 uh, users the google dashboard is not work yeah yeah, yeah. everything else is there so we we kind of realized that it won't work for us and my background is data platform i did 5 years at netflix as i told you so i think one thing which is a good thing that has happened is we realized that the systems that power data platforms and the systems that power features at scale kind of converge Hmm. you know the is the same kafka pipelines it's the same application yeah. layers the same horizontal scalability no sql databases um, and obviously proprietary things like redshift and all yeah. help out right so we we invested heavily in the entire data pipeline and uh, our approach there has also been similar like build it like a platform you know self service we don't want to get it to a point where you know there was a time where for every every time a service is to go live we used to sit with the service owner and pipe it and say that this event will flow here and all and we said okay you know what I'm going to give you the rails. I'm going to give you the pipes and plug and play. So you write a service. You just plug in this. You says your you know your events will start flowing, and then all the magic typical ETL layers. You know how do you plug in your logic to actually generate the layers that you want? Um, how do you merge the click stream data to the transactional data? Yeah. And um, again, an RMG app. So there's a lot of money reconciliation that needs to happen. How many? How you know we call it an AB tracker. So it's an account balance tracker. Hmm. So think of it like a system that tracks every single rupee in our platform. Hmm. So every single transaction, there's a ledger. Yeah. And then where is the money coming in? Where is the money going from? Because we have an escrow account, money needs to go there. So there's a lot of money movement as well. Yeah. So that entire system has to be like sacrosanct. And that for is us. unlike like product analytics, you can't drop events from we, there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you cannot drop a single event. You know, yes. it's like so we have to double check and make sure that it's reconciled every single day and then at different periods and it has to match with the, my. 
clickstream data in some case which obviously does drop there but i think the contest joins and the uh, amounts for example everything has to match so there's a lot of work that goes behind building all of that um but yeah i think the beauty of data is like what you can build with it right so as i said so our system is um, so dream 11 is nothing but contests right so you right. compete with other people so there are free contests and paid contests so the smallest contest size is two member where you can go head to head with someone and uh, the largest contest is like 1.5 crore or maybe 2 crores i think i don't remember i'm losing count now yeah. of entries in a single contest you know for a typical ipl game we generate around maybe 10 million contests right and um, when i joined obviously uh, so the mega all, contest is the one that we advertise a, as the big big, one, the big one the biggest prize money everybody right. joins but there's like two member three member five ten okay and then there are like 100 member and there's a special one all kinds of contests are there right so you know for us as a platform if i generate lesser contests than what the demand is then i leave money on the table mm. revenue got right? it yeah, yeah but if i over generate the contest if i create a contest which will not fill then because those are guaranteed i have to pay out the pay out the prize money yeah. i have to take the hit personally right so it's a perfect yeah, yeah, yeah. balance of like you know the right contest not at the right enough time. to like losing more money so yeah. the last minute like it should fill and you know and, and try to fill it with the, the mega contest also our, our goal is always to make sure the mega contest fills in the last minute right, right? now imagine this is the kind of contest we are talk, talking about ipl millions of contests now there are 17000 matches with millions of contests different size so very early on we started investing in this you know back in the day there was only one guy our cpo <laughs> who we would just create okay ye contest dalo ye dalo you know they're doing manually <laughs> some of the contests are auto generated you know the two member contest i don't need to spend too much time every time people create a contest and they share or something no like. no that's not there so we have a two member contest of a certain prize money and then once that fills i regenerate it so that's very simple ah, okay, right like but two people join it and then yes three. exactly right but the larger contests are a very different play you know getting the right template you know what is a so for example now in an ipl right now if a contest fails what should i generate with 10 minutes to go 1 crore 4 crores 5 crores 10 crores that's a decision point right yeah, yeah. so that's something we uh, we that's our flagship ml project that we started like 6 years ago called and it's a very simple name contest generation engine it's crudely <laughs> called right and uh, we've actually matured that system to a point where you know 99 we, we achieve a 99.9% fill rate in our contest so we you know nice. other than the small deviations here and there yeah, yeah. we went through a lot of iterations over it again there also we didn't get it right initially we had it generated contest that didn't fill it generated con- smaller contest that it should have but we kept persisting over it so i think again data right like leasing the patterns seeing the fill rates and what's challenging for us is uh, external events can change things so we may predict a game of a certain interest right. for example let's say i'll I, I say that this match should get a contest of 10 crore and suddenly Virat Kohli doesn't play mm. or Bumrah doesn't play and suddenly the interest drops yeah. you know so those things we have to account for then we have to adjust in other contests etc so so that helps and um, you know um, our users need to also have trust in the platform that's one of the most important tenets for us right mm. and obviously in a real money gaming app people try to game the system you know they'll try to create multiple accounts and do all of this so we 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 invested heavily into what we call fence a very nice fancy name right but it's basically in short it's nothing but a network of players that we create to identify patterns you know fraudulent patterns in the app okay and people are trying to create multiple accounts create teams and shuffle money okay. and get bonuses out so we invested a so and there was a big problem we call it fpv it's fair play violation right yeah, so yeah. we for the f- last few years we invested heavily to get to a point where very confident that the fraud that's happening in the system is at a you know very low right. volumes and uh, then we moved on to okay what next you know so it's it's like that constant thing that we solved this right i think we'll keep iterating but what next i think the most latest thing that we actually introduced is ml on edge okay so so far we were like personalizing the contests and giving to the users but you know the ability to understand the wallet balance on the front end at that point or the screen that is seen yeah. so we introduced that small ml model on the app itself on the device itself on the device oh, itself nice. so it's called ml edge right this is the latest thing that we tried and actually and we actually found image we did an experiment it's not scaled up completely but it computes there and sends back a signal and we send a contest based on that Okay. So that's something new. So in the ML space also, so it goes back to data, right? Once you have data of a user, yeah, yeah. even all these businesses like Fancode and all everything, we want to make the experience better. All the data that we've collected over the years, it's what petabytes of data of user engaging with sports, the matches they play, the players that they like, collect everything, invest heavily in ML 
and uh, then give users a, a fantastic experience nice nice fantastic uh so so one last question which i think i will ask in in terms of uh, you know uh, i'll ask the question in two perspectives uh one is like i would definitely want a few words uh from you for uh you know younger mid senior engineers and, and what they want to do in their careers and what they should focus on to to become better engineers and and, and i would probably you know uh, also ask in the same way in the question that you know when when you're looking to you know expand your team getting people on board into this mission uh, which is building systems uh, at this scale and then being very passionate about the product that they're building what are you also looking for and and as a result that's why when you talk about engineers what they should be looking to do in their career to you know become better engineers i think uh, i think it's always been simple right <laughs> when you're an early stage engineer right just develop as much expertise just get as much hands on experience that's why i am not a proponent of remote working right. you know that okay. in 2020 2021 i actually saw that the fresher batch that i hired you know and versus when we are in office they are sitting with seniors all day talking to them having right. lunch with them you know it's very easy for experienced people to get their job done the osmosis the osmosis yeah. the learning that happens you know so so i would say that spend as much time as you can around people who know things right. you know absorb as much as you can and put in the earlier in your career the amount of time that you can spend on building that depth in various things and doesn't i don't care about programming languages just learn anything you know but the fundamentals of software programming the design systems how to architect things you get once you get that foundation it's it's very easy after that to actually move forward if that is not there because you know sometimes people get over eager to manage you know i want to be a manager for example <laughs> yeah. right or they would get this um, fomo after one to one and a half two years i'm like oh i need to now jump ship either it could be because of compensation reasons or maybe they're like oh something something shiny out there that i need to do right so try to sp- so if you look at my career i've had three main jobs i spent four and a half years at first five and a half years at the second and this is seven years at dream 11 right, right? you you know the amount of uh, connections that you make at a place and the understanding that you have and if the organization obviously is conducive to it you can learn a lot right. and go deeper into the systems etc whereas if you go somewhere as you start from scratch obviously you get some exposure to new things so you have to like figure it out but spend as much time in as developing depth as possible because that is the base for everything else that you will do in the future other skills you can develop over time right. but trust me once you are at 6 7 years 8 years experience develop at a senior level you get less and less time to do this then mm. you'll be like you know i'll have to spend time on the weekend or maybe in the evening because you have other responsibilities you're responsible for other people yeah so yeah. make sure that in depth fundamentally you're very very strong that is the most important advice that i would give to anyone and and that's also what you're looking for when you're yeah for me i think uh, one thing i've realized is uh, yeah what's my interview based on i think obviously some experience you know one mistake that people make while interviewing people is they interview them for what we want <laughs> right we look at okay this is our requirements and then i am going to like it doesn't matter how much time you spent on that what you've done it doesn't matter to me i mean that's and that's something that we again made mistakes and realize and yeah. said let's focus on the strengths of the candidate right let's get the profile which is as adjacent to what we want to do so that there are similarities but we focus on their strengths we focus on if you have done good work you tell me what you've done if you understand it completely and if you exhibit good attitude of learning and adaptability right. i've had people who so 90% of my services are written in java i've had people who don't know java at all for example right. i've had people who don't know any distributed systems experience but the way they look at algorithms the way they the work that they have done right i'm very confident that in the next 6 months they will just adapt and learn right, right. so we look for culture fits we look for strong fundamentals in people and we look for people that who know the work that they've done in and out yeah. once you have this combination in most of the times it just works out i think that's that's what i look for nice nice thanks uh, for for uh, you know uh, elaborating on that and for uh, all the answers uh, so far as well uh, and and again like uh, all, all the best to you and me as well for the coming ipl <laughs> Yeah, yeah i think and yeah, you know hiring will always be a challenge right, right? and i said earlier like you are in mumbai i think that there are what 50 unicorns and unicorns in mumbai mm. now yeah. right so it's like that ecosystem is growing there's a lot of funding yeah. coming into the picture so um, looking to get talent there and like join us <laughs> <laughs> and, and obviously we'll like build. great stuff like i mean building uh, and in these days like like 
uh, I remember uh, long time back when uh, Hotstar first published that they broke the streaming record. And, and I, I told that to some of my friends and they were like, how is it possible that Hotstar is breaking the streaming record? Must be somebody outside India would have been like, you won't relate to that, that okay, an Indian company would build a product and uh, bro- broke the streaming record. And I was like, dude, where else are there so many people to use it? It's, it's here. No, we had a ex- very similar conversation last April and even now we said that I did the same thing because I've seen Hotstar numbers, I think now with Geo Cinema numbers and I'm like, okay, that's like a, a video platform, right? But what about gaming? What about people who come into the platform to play? Let yeah. me look at some numbers. And from at least from my research, I could anecdotally only find two, right? One was some Steam had an event, mm. concurrent user, some 10 odd million. And then Fortnite, the biggest Fortnite, event, Fortnite yeah. the biggest event that they did, I think the number they clocked was 14 million. Yeah. So 14 million concurrent gamers had come to the platform to do something. And we are actually on target to break that this IPL. Great. great. <laughs> you know? So similar parallels, right? That the number of people here and the kind of product that you to build for the Indian market you have to be, and if we see 50 million users watching sports, I, we can very easily envision have 20 to 25 million of them coming to Dream 11 Monday and just being on the platform because that ratio, when you were at 20 million, 25 million in um, uh, Hotstar, we were clocking seven, eight million, right? Uh, yeah. So as that pie grows, we expect the number at, they're online, they're watching the sport, they just have to come to Dream 11 and make a team. So we also expect to breach like 20, 25 million concurrent users transacting on our platform in that 25 minute window and maybe in a couple of IPLs. Yeah, and that will be a great feat. So, you know, biggest uh, fantasy platform in the world, onwards and upwards. Thank you so much. (laughs)